Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, and ex-Scotland International and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. We're going to be joined by Leon captain, Jordan Talfour, shortly as well, as they look to build on their Challenge Cup title last season and make it into the top 14 playoffs for the first time in a few years this season. How are you, first of all, Johnny, though? South of France, everything okay? All good, mate. Sun is shining, settled back in. European rugby is back. Uh, so I'll be up in La Rochelle this weekend with BT Sport. Um, and yeah, Six Nations around the court. It seems like it's coming around really quickly. Um, madness is about to start all again, but all good here. Everybody's settled now, back into the routine. Everyone's catching bugs and shit at crash, standard <laughs> service. How about your house? Caught up any sleep yet or is it still the same old? I'm getting four hours a night instead of three now. Is that better? That's all, yeah. that's all you need. That's all you need. That's what they say. <laughs> I'm sure that's what they say. If you're Prime Minister, you live on four hours a night, don't you? So, Good luck, mate. La Rochelle, though, very nice. Expecting another big win, presumably, given what happened before Christmas. Yeah, I think Ulster have a little bee in their bonnet, though, to be fair. Uh, a little point to prove. So I think it could be, um, yeah, fairly tasty. I'm not expecting Ulster to get pumped by no means. And they showed that the rugby they um, are capable of playing, even in front of an empty stadium, is very, very good. They just left it too little, too late um, against La Rochelle in the home game. Um, but I'm expecting a big old game this weekend um, and a wee bit of a chip on the shoulder of the Ulsterman, 100%. We'll come on to more of the Champions Cup later on. But before we get on to the rugby on the pitch, it seems like a lot of talk this week has been yeah. about the coaching merry-go-round in France. And there's one in particular rumour that caught the eye and that you'll be able to comment a lot on. Has Gregor Townsend thrown his hat into the ring to be a France assistant coach after the next World Cup or not? Well, that's what French press is reporting. They said they've had two submitted to them. So Gonzalo Casada from Stade Francais um, and Gregor. Um, and I haven't messaged them to get him to confirm it or deny it. But I think, well, I know Gregor's got a soft spot for French rugby. Um, he really enjoyed his time here as a player. Um, with Cast, Montpellier and Brieve. So why not? Crazier things have happened. He slotted as an assistant on the Lions tour um, and potentially a consultancy role or attack specialist role he might really relish. And that could also be a springboard into club coaching in the top 14 as a nice sort of, not easy one to break in, but you know, right at the top, a French team that's firing, could you get involved with them and then potentially end up um, with a big club job as a head coach in the top 14. So crazier things have happened um, and he's now standing coach. So we'll see. You can sort of see it happening, but he is currently Scotland head coach and therefore it's not yeah. kind of a great look, is it? He he wouldn't want that to come out in the media. No, he wouldn't. But that's also the nature of the beast. That's the nature of every single professional rugby player and every single coach is that you have a fixed term contract that's two or three or four years. And then you're within your rights to negotiate and try and find a job for when your contract expires. Otherwise you're, you're struggling to pay the mortgage at the end of the month. So um, as much as he wouldn't want it leaked um, as nobody would, I think there's an understanding that in the professional era, you, you, you're you looking for jobs and you want to keep your, your gigs going and you want them to be as big as possible. And that would be a, a big gig. Um, the only, the only weird thing I would say about it is that, I haven't known or been coached by Gregor as a head coach. I only knew him as an attack coach. And that's how I knew Fabian. They're both very similar, very big on their detail, um, excellent in their attack specifics. So that'd be the only crossover. I, I would see how would that work? Would, would Fabian go to a more director of rugby and Gregor would be left with the attack role? Um, but in any in any sense, you've got pure coaching terms to an excellent attack mind. So it could only add and make them better. The collaboration would be excellent. Also, when you look at the team they're sticking together, it, it would then become quite multinational again in that the two guys that are leaving, Labitte and Gazal, are French. Um, you've obviously got Sean Edwards there. You then have um, Gregor coming in as a Scot uh, alongside Laurent Saint-Péré, who the former hooker who's at Stade Francais. It looks like he's going to be joining as the forwards coach as well. That's been announced this morning in French media. Um and statistically, you can't argue with a side that was struggling um, last year, again, with Gonzalo Casada, exactly the same. They've been exceptional this year. And statistically, the forwards have been excellent in terms of scrum ball one. Um, I think they've pilfered something like 30% of opposition line out ball. So like the detail they're going through, the the work they're getting through at line out is excellent. I think they're the top of the tree for the amount of 
tries scored from Maul or from the two phases after Maul um, through all the stats. So like clearly well organized um, and with a young French side are, are doing really, really well. So those two guys as well could could very well jump into the, the French setup as well. You mentioned there how Gregor and Fabian might work together if it were to go that way. You obviously do know them both well. In terms of their coaching philosophies, do you see quite a lot of similarities there in terms of how they might work in tandem? Do you know what? It's been so long. And weirdly, when I was when when I was working with Gregor, he was so young and at the start of his coaching journey that he didn't really have that much time with us, but you could tell he had it in him. You would have the conversation, you would just you would know that he understood rugby, he knew how to break down defenses, but he wasn't given that much time with us. But as his careers progressed, like for instance, when I was looking back at Glasgow and he was head coach and they were winning the Pro 14 title, like clearly the attack philosophies, the templates they use, the willingness to speed up the game, keep the ball in play, all very similar to Fabian. Um, and Gregor clearly is the best Scottish coach that we've had in a generation. So attack-minded, um, great eye for detail. In terms of personalities and the way they work, probably a little bit different, but I haven't worked under Gregor as a head coach, so I couldn't really comment. Um but in any case, both very smart men, very articulate, big on their detail, uh, and they both organise some terrific attack. And speaking of Scotland, Johnny, AB's under, he's left. Is he headed to Lyon? Again, that's what French press is reporting again this week, um, in that he's asked to leave for family reasons. Uh, looks like there'll be a little bit of evolution in the Lyon staff as well. Kenny Lynn potentially moving on, if those reports are correct. And AB coming in um, to mix things up in, in the attack for Leon, but you know he, he's got a big reputation over here as well. Um, the work that he did with Toulouse, how highly he was rated, um, they absolutely love him. Um, and so I, I thought, or I, I thought it wouldn't be long that he would do that type of consultancy role again with Scotland. But then the lure of a big contract back in the top fourteen and a big club like Leon, um, with Garbage also looking to kick on and, and put his imprint properly on that side over the next couple of seasons and um, that's a big move for AB Zonda as well if that's correct and former Leon boss Pierre Mignoni now at Toulon <laughs> apparently was wanted by Fabian Galtier with France but he said he's staying at Toulon isn't he yeah and I think that's a big shot on the arm for Toulon in that it didn't look good uh, again they lost again this they lost again this weekend the manner of the defeat um not great when you've got all throughout national French press, your head coach who's just signed to be part of a four-year project, the sort of child of the city, if you want, like he's got all of his business interests and grew up in Toulon, apparently then turning his back after six months into a contract, you know, Toulon supporters this week were not happy. You could see all over social media um, airing their concerns, shall we say. Um, so I think for him, the right move to stay, but also for the club, just to show that it was on a stable footing um, they were sure of themselves and they've actually got a project that they're proud of and looking forward to building on. And Pierre is that man to lead that club. Um, he's the man that they've wanted for a number of years. Um, and so, yeah, it was muted in French press. I think Fabian did want him, but he's decided to stay, which is a good thing for Toulon. And finally on the coaching front, I know we've chatted about it for a few weeks now, but official confirmation that Yannick Brew and Thibaut Giroud are going to Bordeaux. Big contracts as well. Uh, again, it's becoming more and more. We talk about the renegotiation stage, but that's it. When you find somebody that you want and you nail them down, the security that you want to build into that club, like four-year contracts for both of them. Those are big contracts in professional rugby clubs. Um, and there'll be big paydays for both of those guys. Um, Yannick Brew coming back from the Sharks out in Durban at the end of the season. Thibaut Giroud will join up after the World Cup with the French side. Assistance yet to be confirmed, but the likes of Noel Mac McNamara, you heard of him? Yep. Yeah. Um, a real superstar, massive reputation back in Ireland, Super Mac, as he's known, was the attack coach at Leinster. He's currently out of the Sharks with Brute. Um, so again, Yana could be saying, come with me in my luggage, come join me. Um, he looks like he could potentially be the attack coach. You've also got Avicenti Girogadze, line-out coach. Hooker played at Toulon, Cast, Toulouse. Looks like he might join as... Um, Lineout coach as well. And the recruitment is now picking up. You know, Damian Penno announced Paul Abadi from Brieve, the scrum half, he signed as well. Uh, Hooker from Monomarsan, Roman Latarad has signed as well. So things slowly taking shape. Um, they're still waiting on Radrada to see if he's going to um, sign for next season. But I think Laurent Marty will be happy that he's got his man, the man that he wanted. 
um, and that you can now focus on building for next season. Right. We won't chat too much about the top 14 because we want to get Jordan on for a chat and look ahead to Europe a bit later on as well. But there were a few decent highlights from the weekend of the top 14. Yeah. And I've got a little suspicion where the meter moment of the week might be heading. So do you want to let us know what it is, Johnny? It was a 50-50 for me, mate. There was an absolute worldy from Perpignan as well. Yeah. End-to-end -end running out of the 22. Great finish in a game that was dubbed over here a clash of two pro de deux sides. Nope. They were absolutely hammered after that game. Clermont, who kind of got out of jail and, and beat Perpignan. Um, but it comes from Bordeaux, and we chatted oh. to Uzer last week, the big man who talked us through Bayonne and the side they sent up there, which actually was a mix, you know, almost like a second 15, but were very competitive. But one moment stood out. Bordeaux got the better of them in the end, and effectively this moment killed the game. Maxime Lucu started off. He rattled a 50-22 from inside his own 10. By this stage, Bayon are absolutely gassed in the second half as well. They've given absolutely everything, scrabbling to get back. But there's an absolute belter of a kick chase from young Louis Biaibari. He right, regathered the ball in touch, knowing it's his own throw. And Moefana comes from like 50 metres back, runs onto the ball, which is taken quickly with a quick throw in. Defence and kick chase turned into trying five seconds by simple hard work and quick thinking. It was utter class and easily the meter moment of the week for this weekend's rugby. Yeah, first time we've seen that from a 50-22, but you, know, you can guarantee that defence coaches Everyone. all over Europe are watching that Everyone. saying, this is it, <laughs> this is it. Why are we not doing this? Um, yeah. But that was it, super quick thinking. But you got to think now, like that is your winger's bread and butter. They are going to be up there. If it's not going to be up contested in there, the next one is going to be, if we're going 50-22, how quickly can we turn that defence into attack? It's effectively a turnover with a three throw-in. So how much do you want it? Can you get on the end of that ball and dot it down? And it was super simple. But that, really strangely, it was a big tussle at the weekend, but that try killed the encounter. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can now get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD10, and you get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Let's get our guest on now then and have a chat about all things Leon with their captain and Samoa International, Jordan Taufua. How you doing? Good, mate. Thanks for having us on here. We will talk more generally in a minute, but how big a win was that at the weekend at Poe? given what had gone before, because you were flying, heading into December, a little bit of a rocky patch. So what was the feeling afterwards? Oh, yeah, it's probably more a sign of a relief. Um, you know, I think we went five games on the losing streak, so just had to really look, you know, at each other and as a, as a whole group. And, yeah, go down to Poe wasn't an easy fit because Poe's Poe was tracking, we're tracking really well as well. And I think they're in the same spot as us. A uh, bit of an up-down season, but we were... Uh, to go down to Poe and get the result, um, to get the five points, uh, was, was was a massive uh, positive and uh, and hopefully uh, you know we continue on that way. And you mentioned that five game losing streak. The crazy thing with the top fourteen is that can effectively happen to any team these days. Like everyone can be everyone, but give us a little insight into what it's like at Leon because they haven't been in the top fourteen that long, six years, seven years. But it's an ambitious club. So what's the feel around the club? Oh, the field in the club is, is pretty good. Um, you know, it's just like you said, they've built uh, something for the last six to seven years to stay in the top 14. Uh, before that, they were battling uh, between coming up to top 14 and then getting relegated down to 32. So uh, for us to be, you know, to have a stable uh, staying in the top 14, but also competing, um, you know, we don't just want to, you know, just hang in there. Um, and they've come a long way. And I guess that's why I'm here as well, just to help them, uh, you know, try to get to that, that next step. And um, yeah, Leon is a, is really an ambitious club. Got some good players, quality players. Um, we just, you know, stringing those performances on the field um, because, you know, one time we can do it and then the, the next, you know, it's a, it's a battle uh, away. But um, yeah, the top 14, it's a, it's a marathon. You know, it's uh, um, everyone here talks about it, even the French boys. Uh, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So I guess that's what's different from Super Rugby and, uh, and all the other competitions. 
And that's it. As a leader, you've come on like very visible now. You have a big leadership role, very respected, central to all things positive on field and clearly as well, a big influence off field. What are those big differences? You mentioned the marathon, but when you're taking that experience into a comp like the top 14, what have you taken from Super, from Prem, from your time around the world to try and bring to this young Leon side? Yeah, I guess it's having a calm head. It's quite weird. You know, you say, uh, you know, I've been in the game for you know, the last 10 years, but still feel young and at heart. But, you know, coming into this uh, young Leon squad, you know, we've got an average age, I'm pretty sure, 23. Um, so, you know, getting guys like me in here and, you know, just to, just to lead them, have a calm head and, and obviously a different side of rugby, uh, because you've got some exciting, talented players here in, in Lyon, just uh, pushing us all in the right direction to get there. And you've won Super Rugby titles. So talk us through the European Challenge Cup title for Lyon last season. Where does that rank in terms of your achievements? And I guess more so for Lyon, given what we said about them having only been in the top 14 for six or seven years. How big was that in terms of the road that the club is on? Yeah, it was, the, it was, it was massive. I had time to reflect on it after the season and, it was the it was the club's first uh, European Championship that they've ever won. Uh, you know they've they've usually in the top fourteen. Uh, it's just you know the top fourteen. That's all they focus on. But to get to the uh, Challenge Cup final against Toulon and it was a Royal French final in Marseille, man, that was 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 pretty much. I think it was the most uh, most people there at, uh, at at a Challenge Cup final. But for this club, it's it's, it's a massive step in the right direction. Um, obviously, they want to keep continue to grow, but it's uh, some of these boys here at Lyon have never won a championship, and the belief that they have now to to to, to have a feel at Marseille to win a final, um, you know, for myself, it's that was more probably for me it was more uh, what's the word? Uh, it was it was more uh, inside of me. Like I I I felt like I achieved something for this club. Um, to see the faces because I've won, just like you said, I've won, I've won championships, I've won Super Rugby championships. Um, so to see the faces on my teammates that, uh, you know, that they got there and now they know that they can believe to win and, and get there, you know, that's more of a, uh, for me, that was that was a big thing for me. And a man that's been spoken about a lot this week in French media, the, the man that brought you to Lyon, Pierre Mignoni, now at Toulon, what was he like as a coach? Also as a bloke, obviously a bit change of the guard, we'll talk about Xavier Garbajosa in a minute, but that trophy, the win, consistency in the top 14, what was it that Pierre brought to Lyon? Well, I think with Pierre, we had a good relationship. Um, you know, for the last two years, oh, over the last year and a half, when I first got here and we met, um, you know, he's he had a stigma about him. You know, he was a really like, he was a little guy walking around, you know, and everyone was scared of him. <laughs> for me, I was I was just happy and, you know, just myself. And, um, you know, for me, I'm a player that leads with actions, not words. And I think he saw that and, you know, we had a really good understanding on where we wanted to go and his vision, um, you know, with, with the club and what he's produced over the last six, seven years with this club, um, you know, to get to that Challenge Cup final was massive for him. Um, but now nah, Pierre is a, is a great leader. He's a great manager, um, you know, and, and, and we just had a great understanding, which, which worked. And now the change. So now Xavier Garbajosa, can you compare and contrast a little bit for us? Obviously, it's going to take time for his style to settle down and imprint on you as a squad. But in terms of the bloke, the environment, the way of playing changed much, or is it sort of the same? I think it's just, a, you know, as, a, as every new coach that starts, you know, there's some teething to go around just to getting used to the boys, the environment, because at the end of the day, you know, you didn't select the team, you've come in and you're inheriting what, what was here before. So, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely going through that process and, you know, we're, we're starting to come right. You know, just like you said, a top 14 is a, is a marathon. So, um, you know, things in Poe, how uh, we're starting to click now. We're hoping to to go up. And Xavier Garbo Jose is just the same. He, he, we have an understanding um, as a as a leader, but also a leadership group. Um, you know, it's just us working together and um, all of us understanding to get to where we, we want to get. So you're obviously loving life in Leon at the moment, but how was it at Leicester before that? Because you moved sort of mid-season. Yeah, I moved, uh, moved over in 2019. Um, so straight off the Maritain Cup in New Zealand, I moved over. Um, you know, and that, and exactly what you said. You know, it was a uh, Leon's an ambitious club, and Leicester were going through a really rough patch. Um, you know, and then they had ambitions to get back into, you know, to where they are. Um, and that that was my, uh, I guess my goal was to go to to Leicester and, and and bring my you know my experience to to Leicester. And obviously, with COVID hitting, 
um, you know, and with all the pay deductions and and and, and things like that, um, you know, you had to make a decision. And you know, we we parted ways, and and Leon, the opportunity of Leon um, came about. So uh, it was there was a you know it was an agreement. Um, both you know, did I want to leave? You know, it wasn't was you know I signed three years there, so I wanted to stay and and, and develop the club, but. You know, with, with with the situation that happened, you know, you just have to go where the opportunity goes. And you can't predict the future. Obviously, Leicester won the title last season, but it was a yeah. very turbulent time for them. Jordan Murphy, obviously leaving, who presumably mm. was heavily involved in you going to Leicester. Yes, yes, Jordan Murphy was the one that I was actually doing all my liaising with and talking with when I came to the club. And uh, it's just funny, you know, coming on this side, it's a lot, a lot bigger uh, ballpark and how things work. So, uh, you know, with the business side and. And, and the clubs, um, whereas the Super Rugby, it's it's all in house, and it, you know, kind of goes goes one way and then up the other. But here, it's you know, whatever situation happens, you know, you can you can be gone just like that. So, uh, yeah, exactly. You can't predict the the future, and you can't can't predict what's happened. So you just got to take opportunities where where they come. And now the opportunity's there. You're now captain at Leon, and killing it. <laughs> so how did that come? When did the, when did that conversation happen? Who took you aside and asked you if you wanted to do the role? And how big an honor is that? Oh man, it was it was Pierre. Um, just randomly came up to me one preseason because um, I actually went there as a medical joker first to cover for Machu Busto who who had an yep. injury, um, and then I went over and uh, came over for like five games, played five games, and then uh, uh, got injured. Um, I tore my pick. Uh, we'll get into that story, but I uh, had a preseason um, <laughs> of the, the the following year, and yeah, Pierre just came up to me because oh, I want you to be my captain, and I was like. Um, hey, look, mate, do you know I don't speak French? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I was like, oh, I didn't know. Yeah, it was, it was a shock to me. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. Um, you know, just, just coming in, only being in there for like four months, four, five months, and then getting asked uh, if you wanted to lead. And, you know, I said, hey, look, I'll lead. Um, not much of a speaker, but, you know, I'll lead these boys. But really, really, what happened to your pack? Now you said there's another story. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, I said I wouldn't tell many people about the story, but uh, you know, not as well. Uh, yeah, so Pierre actually gave me the whole uh, whole week off. I just played five games. So he's like, "Look, mate, here and here at top fourteen, it's so long season. So you know, when a coach gives you the week off, just to, and then just turn up the captains around and play, man, that's that's like I'm real. That's gold. Unreal. That's gold. You 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 keep that. But uh, for me, I was like, wow, oh, man." I didn't know what to do with all the energy I was built inside of me on a Monday when getting told, you know, you got the whole week off. So I went and did my conditioning off feet, did my upper body gym session. And then after it, I was just like, you know, I was just happy to have a week off. And then I saw over um, the, the Esquire, the Academy boys, we're doing some CrossFit training. Uh, <laughs> so I went and decided to go and join them. Uh, we were doing muscle ups uh, and, you know, you know, oh. all that clean, clean and jerk and stuff. So I was like, you know, like, oh yeah. Get up there, man, you know. So you know, I'm still young. <laughs> and then jumped up, went and got up, uh, failed the first one. And I was like, you know, I've always got it. So I went up again and I flipped my shoulder over my left <sighs> one and pop, bang, fell on my back. And I was like, ooh, never felt this before. And <sighs> man, just, man, what was what was sad? Yeah, they pretty much when I saw the doctor and he said, man, I think you're torn your pick, your pick's gone. So, and then, just having to go to Pierre like literally like an hour before he's just told me you've got the whole week off and just seeing his face, man, that, that was, yeah, that wasn't the best feeling. But yeah, that's how I tore my pick. So anyone that's watching this, uh, Young Bucks, if you're actually over 25, don't do a muscle up. <laughs> don't do muscle ups. <laughs> Nobody do muscle does up. muscle ups. No, nah, no. Nah. Johnny, have you ever been guilty of that? Someone gave you a week off training with the kids. I mean, I, I think I'd Mate, sleep for are a week you joking? A week off. I, I would be so far out of sight. Oh man, I'm gutted for yeah. you. But then that week off turned into four months off. So actually, it wasn't a, it wasn't yeah, a bad so thing. I went, I went back to New Zealand and enjoyed a, enjoyed a, a break, and then came back refreshed. <laughs> Did some more muscle ups. So I hasn't worked this oh, time. Man. So yeah. No, no more muscle ups. Speaking of New Zealand, let's just touch on your time there because obviously there is a big contrast between life in France and life in New Zealand. You were massively successful back home, over 100 games for the Crusaders, three Super Rugby titles. What was it like being part of that dynasty, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's something special reflecting back and um, you know, looking back at, at, at winning those Super Rugby championships but playing, you know, 100 plus to you know to get him in one game for the Crusaders uh you know it's such a successful club and 
you know, a lot of teams, you know, try to target you week in, week out. So you're actually playing like pretty much test matches every every week. So uh, to be part of it and to, I guess, leave a legacy for me, it was basically getting to 100 games, being the first Pacific Islander to do it. Um, you know, that was my motivation at the time. And, uh, you know, once once that was ticked, you know, it was, it's, it's time to test yourself somewhere else and to come on this side. So, um, you know, Crusaders is, is such a family club and, uh, you know, boys, everyone's on the same page. Everyone wants to, to get make each other better and, and understand uh, the road, the journey where you, where you want to get to. And, uh, you know, you're, everyone wants to win titles. So, you know, that's the club to, I guess, the, the best club to be a part of. And the man that's won a few titles, there's a hell of a lot of talk about Scott Robertson at the moment in relation to just about every job going. So can you give us an insight into what he's like as a coach? We've seen from the Barbarians documentary that dropped in the past week as well, some inspirational words, but week in, week out, through the months and years, what's he like to be around? Oh, just what you see is what you get. Um, you know, he's he's far left with, with the way he thinks about rugby. Um, you know, new ideas coming in, um, you know, every week, uh, every day. You don't know what you're going to get with Razor, but, you know, his energy is the same. Um, you know, he, he has a great mentality when to switch on and when to switch off. And when you're off, you know, you, you're getting together, you're making sure you, you're you saying hi to each other. I think he took uh, the method from from France, you know, you know, everyone's saying, Bonjour in the morning and, you know, Sava, how are you? Um, you know, he's bringing that to the Crusaders, you know, making sure that everyone says hello every time you see each other, you're connecting. And I think for Fereza, he's a really good uh, manager and I guess knowing how to talk to talk to people, um, you know, and I think that's very, very important in the coach and in, in a manager is how you talk to players. Uh, I guess in New Zealand, Fereza, you know, with these different ways you speak to Pacific Islanders, these different ways you speak to to to, to other other cultures, and he respects everyone's uh, you know, like his opinion and, and, and cultures. And yeah, that's that's probably you know, that's one part of why he's so successful. Did he teach you a bit of dancing as well or not? Oh man, I tell you what, if he does <laughs> any more break dancing, he's gonna break that back of his uh... <laughs> muscle ups uh... and break dancing. Oh man, he, oh, yeah, no, nah, he definitely ain't doing no muscle ups. I don't know if those <laughs> knees knees are any good, but <laughs> And so individually, you talked about different ways of looking after different people and manage, man management, which is such a big part of our game now. How big an impact did he have on your career personally? How did he help you to improve as a player? Well, for, I guess for Azel, we could have a, a honest conversation. Um, you know, and he always wanted to, obviously he was a loose forward, so we connected on that level, you know, of how to be better, what, what to do uh, in situations and, uh, you know, the technical side, but then also off the field side, you know, I was, I was known in the team, you know, that bring the culture and the energy, um, you know, with Richie Mwonga and some of the other boys. But, you know, he he pretty much let me be who I am and, um, you know, express who, who who I am, who I was. So, you know, he, and that's one, that was one of the biggest things that I guess why we were successful in the time I was there. It was just everyone expressing themselves and being themselves. Are you surprised he hasn't been given the All Blacks job already? And Johnny mentioned there that he's mentioned every time a job comes up anywhere and particularly recently with the England job and the Wales job becoming available and then going to other people do you think a word has maybe been had behind the scenes and he is going to be an All Blacks coach at some point in the not too distant future because he's not getting those jobs because we know he's got international ambition yeah and like you know with Rosa I think for him, you know, every, every, you know, things happen for a reason, and, and the time will come when it's uh, when it's time. And and Reza understands that, you know, he understands the business. And you know, when I see Reza, you know, all this talk, he's just himself, and he doesn't go too far forward. He has, you know, future ambitions. Everyone's got future ambitions, but the thing I like about Reza, he always takes care of what's in front of him. And you know, he's the Crusaders' head coach at the moment. You know, he's, his his goal right now is to to win another title. So. Um, you know, if the door comes knocking from any international team, you know, he, he'll definitely take it with both hands and whatever one he picks, you know, uh, he'll be aware of, uh, yeah, he, he'll definitely shape up uh, whatever team uh, he goes to. And that's it. There's no doubt that he will end up on the international stage. The question is just which team. Um, hey, this exactly. as well, like back in the day, he played for Perpignan. How do you reckon he'd get on transitioning and coaching in France in the top 14? I think it'd be all right. Uh, might have to sharpen up on his fridge, but um, <laughs> his, his energy and, and, and it's addictive here. And I, I feel like in France, rugby, they, they, they love energy, but it's if you can back up that energy, you know, because uh, 
uh, you know, you've played in France um, before, you know, it, the, the challenging games are actually the away games. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a big mindset um, thing, what I've found here. But, you know, having the mindset to go to anywhere and, and win, that's 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 the next step for uh, for, for for I guess a, a, a French manager or coach, um, and that's uh, I know Ray's has been here before, so he'll understand that too. And speaking of international ambition, you made your debut for Samoa in the summer, having previously played for New Zealand under twenty as well as Samoa under twenty. So, how did that come about? Did they approach you, or did you approach them? I think last year or the year before, I just had a message or a phone call from Mark, my Mapasua. Um, you know, and he, he explained to me his ambitions and goals for, for the future of Samoa rugby. And, you know, uh, I asked him a few questions um, and, he, and he answered them directly. He didn't uh, sh- shy away from them. And, you know, I said to him, you know, I want to be a part of your team. So uh, that's how that came about. And, yeah, it was, it's been great. Um, you know, the steps uh, were put in place from uh, when I joined in PNC and and uh, and in the November test. Uh, it's like going home, you know, uh, big thing about us is, is family so uh, playing for your family playing for your face and also your culture so it's all it's pretty cool coming to a place where everyone's the same that must feel amazing like given the rule changes that's allowed this facilitation for players to go back and represent their country their family their friends having not been part of international rugby for a while it must be awesome it must be so good you mentioned it's like going home but it must be an unbelievable feeling now for the boys to go back and represent their countries that they've wanted to for so long. Oh, exactly. Yeah, especially the small islands. Uh, you know, a lot of sacrifices that your parents make for you to, to have a better life. And the way we, we show it is to go back to them, is to go out there and, you know, and play the best rugby, you know, some one of some more rugby that everyone knows. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, you know, you don't play for, for money. You don't play for, for fame. You, you know, you, you play for, uh, for, 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 for an opportunity to put the Mono Samo jersey on. So, uh, it's it, it, it's pretty pretty awesome. It's a feeling that you can't really, you know, fully uh, express or, or explain. You were so close to playing for the All Blacks as well. Obviously, you named in the New Zealand squad to face France in 2018. Broke your arm, it didn't quite happen. So, how gutting was that at the time? And is that a big regret that it didn't happen then? Uh yeah. With, with, with rugby, it comes injuries, and you know, with, when those injuries happened back in 2018, you know, those are out of your control. Um, you know, you kind of have your own pity party to yourself for, for, for a couple of days and then you set new goals. And uh, I have no regrets um, in, in the journey that I've been on to lead me to where I am today. And, and not putting that black jersey on is, is you know, there's no regrets in that. Um, you know, it's all part of the game. And uh, for me, it was to get a, was, was, was the blessing was to get another opportunity to play international rugby with Manu Samoa and, um, you know, taking that with, with, with both hands. Um, but, yeah, just like I said, you know, you can't really plan for the future with whatever happens. But uh, so, so I'm happy where I am today. And mate, now you have that opportunity with the Samoan squad, with the rule changes. You're in a pool now with England, Argentina, Japan and Chile at the World Cup in France. You fancy your chances of going through? Oh, yeah, of course. I wouldn't, you know, I think everyone, um, you know, fancies their chance of, of getting to, to the final and winning the World Cup. Um, you know, and that's that's my ambition to to take some Mono Samoa rugby to to the next level. Uh, you know, if I make the squad, but uh, you know, I'll be definitely adding a bit of flavour to it and trying my best to to get into that team. And how much are you looking forward to? We talked before we start recording about the prospect of being in camp in Montpellier in France. Loads of PI players coming together from small clubs, probably do top fourteen from all around the world. One massive challenge. How much are you looking forward to actually getting together? A proper preseason and then really giving this World Cup a tilt. Oh, it's, it's exciting, especially here in France. Uh, the fans here are, are so uh, supportive of whoever gets on the field. You know, they're they're really passionate fans here, and I guess the people are also awesome people too. So, um, I think a lot of the Monusamo boys uh, play in Europe. So it's basically you know a lot of them are based in France as well. So uh, it'll be an exciting uh, spectacle uh, to, to have the World Cup here, and yeah, I'll be looking forward to it. And obviously, it's all positive now looking ahead to the World Cup with Samoa. I don't want to drag us back down, but because he's on with here, with us here quite a, quite a bit, I've got to mention Jerome Kano's name because everyone was talking about you in relation to the All Blacks, bigging you up. And there was a certain Jerome Kano that was there hogging that jersey for quite a lot of, lot of, lot of time. So if it wasn't for him, you could have 50 All Black caps by now, right? 
Oh, no way. With, with, with Big Loms, you know, I got massive respect for him because he actually started before me and he was the guy that, that was always the, the one that you wanted to, to, to play the best rugby against. So played a few ga- games against him when he was with the Blues and, you know, that was my, that was actually my, you know, my one-on-one, you know, my rival that made me, you know, to be better every every game was to, to okay, what well, you know, to, to, to go up against that uh, Jerome Pino. So, man, I already, I told him, told him this before uh, back in the day and, well, you know, he knows that, you know, he was, he was one of the, the, the guys that you always wanted to, to play your best against, especially as a loose forward, um, you know, the man on defence, you know, just a, just a, a man that was feared by, you know, a lot of rugby players and, and you know, and he was awesome on attack too and just his uh, IQ in rugby is, uh, was, was, was pretty high up there as well. And obviously everything happens for a reason and it's panned out well and you're playing for, for Samoa now. It was not getting another shot at the All Blacks after that year in 2018, was that a kind of motivating factor behind the move to, to Europe initially or or was it a different motivation? No, it was a different motivation. Uh, my one was 100 games uh, to play for the Crusaders. Um, you know, that was my biggest motivation and and I knew that, you know, the All Blacks was... Was was never a guaranteed thing, um, you know. I made the squad, and then I told my calf on the first day of training. I was out for six weeks, and then they said, and then I got told, you know, we're going to be taking on India tour, and then I break my forearm in the semi final against the Hurricanes, you know. So, right. so you know, you can't, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't read or write these things. Um, so, and I knew it was going to be difficult, and because the, the next year in two thousand nineteen, not many, uh, not many teams, or you know, I, I knew the All Blacks were wouldn't try and trial a new player in the World Cup season because they've got their squad, uh, they've got their guys on the man. So, you know, when you, in, in reflecting back, you know, my decision was to come down to pretty much what I wanted to achieve with the Crusaders, win another title, and then, you know, leave on a, on a good note. But I want, on a tangent, I wanted to ask you about the Leon boys. You weren't on the trip, but they ended up in South Africa in European competition. How did the Frenchies take... To traveling South Africa, did because there's so much talk in in France about is it a step too far and uh, are they changing the competition for the good or the bad or whatever. But actually, the logistics of getting there, playing in a different competition, visiting different cities, the experience. What was the feedback when they came came back? Did they love it? Yeah, they, I think they they loved it because um, they came back and they experienced the South Africa traveling and business. You know, we see uh, they've never done that before, and um, you know going to a safari, going to visiting schools. They, they did all this, um, you know, in South Africa. Uh, they, they, they were so grateful and blessed to, 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 to be able to travel uh, to, to a country like South Africa. And uh, I guess in the Bulls, you know, I don't know if he's a player there, but in Pretoria, you know, the altitude gets yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think you can talk about altitude. You know, it's always the first 20 minutes. It's the hardest 20 minutes of your life. Um, but if you can get past that, you'll be all right. And I, and, and I think, you know, with uh, the Leon boys, uh, with, with us going there, they didn't really grasp that it it was talked about, but you know, not really feeling it. Um, you know, once you're there, it's it's a whole different ball game. So, uh, you know, a lot of a lot, of, yeah, you see in there like first twenty minutes, I think it was, it was about four tries scored scored on the boys, and then um, it was a high scoring game towards the end of the game as well. So, uh, but they enjoyed it, they loved it, um, and 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 there is no difficulty, I think, because we're all in the same timeline. So. And you're not easy in Europe this year. You mentioned that game altitude. You've obviously got them to come in the the fourth round, but in between them, Saracens. So you've got a trip to Saracens this week, but it's a it's a tough old schedule for you. Oh, it's it's the Champions Cup. You know, every game's tough, and and that's what you what you look forward to is challenging yourself against uh, you know international players. Uh, they play for their country and and international teams. Uh, last year we played the Challenge Cup final. We won that, and I think the boys now are eager to to go one more. So, um, you know, they're they're definitely uh, looking forward to to hitting. Uh, you know, we're looking forward to hitting to Saracens uh, this week. But uh, the, the 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 game after to come back home um, and play play Saracen here it was a uh, you know it was it was a, it was a, it was a uh, it was challenging for the boys, but they got up for it. You know, we were we were there with them, and then you know just. Their Saracens nailed, uh, you know, one or two things, um, and and they got those points. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a it was it was a spectacle here. So hopefully, getting the other speak to to have another good game. And off the field, we were chatting before we recorded about Lyon being sort of the culinary capital of certainly France, which is not oh. a bad country for the to be the culinary capital of. Are you always taking the boys out for expensive meals on you or what? 
Oh, hell no. No way. <laughs> oh, hey. No, these Frenchies are probably making more than me. They should be taking me out. But uh, no, this is, the food here is amazing, man. Cod de Boeuf. Oh, good steaks oh, here. So oh. good. Yeah, they come out, they, sh- they show it to you, bloody, like, well, which one you want? Like, five different bloody cuts here. And then they just go at the back. They don't even tell you, like, how do you want it? They just go out there, cook it, and you have, here you go. <laughs> But I think Leon is going to, it's a surprise town as well, because not many people know Leon really as a rugby town. So like World Cup time, I think that's going to be a big town of like discovery for people coming in. The food again, like you say to people and they don't really get it, but even like being there for European games in the past or like having played there as a player, like you sneak out on like a Friday night and you get yourself something to eat because it is back. There's so many good restaurants, bars, places to go. So it's a great city. I imagine that you and your family be loving life in the city of Leon as well. Yeah, we love it here and, and you know, we're here till 2025, so um, we're lucky enough to experience it for a little bit longer and, you know, it, uh, we haven't even touched the surface here in Leon. We've done, we, we thought we did one side, but Leon City is such a big place and there's so many restaurants, uh, uh, you won't be able to do it in a couple of years. There's just so many cut de buffs. You're just going to work your way around, <laughs> no, right? Oh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you got old Leon, you got new Leon, oh man, you cross the bridge and somewhere else and you think you're you know, you're, you're at the end of the city and then you go to another direction, you you're, you find a whole new place. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah. And you mentioned getting the captaincy quite early on in your time there and being a bit rusty French-wise back then. How are the French team talks now? Oh, not too bad. Uh, yeah, I've broken French. Um, I, can, I can understand more, more of the boys and um, I can understand what they're saying. I just can't structure great sentences to, to, to go back, but... I think with our leadership group, it's, it works. Uh, you know, the, the, the boys in our leadership group, they do a lot of the talking and, and I just close it up. Uh, if I just need to speak when I need to speak. What is your leadership group? Because you've got a real mix of ages as well within your team. So who sits in that leadership group with you? I find it interesting because you've got some young pups there that are proper talented. Yeah. So we've got uh, Baptiste Collard who's in there. I think he's, he's with the French team. We've got Frankie Gomez. He's with the Argentina team. We've got Felix Lambi. He's been around. He's a young player. I think he's only twenty six, but he's he's been in the French team before, and he's been at Lou since since young. And uh, we he's, have uh, to, yeah, Toby Toby Arnold. He's been here for like ten years. Uh, he's a Kiwi, but he's he's basically French. Um, and you got Ro- Roman Tao. Who else is in there? Got uh, heck. There's, there's a few more boys. Uh, we caught an Arnold Porter and Liam uh, just with the experience with Super Rugby and and obviously where they've been. It's, uh, but we try and call in the young boys to come in and, and sit in and watch and, and, and hopefully learn and because they're the future of the club. Is Jonathan Pellissier in there as well, Pelosh? Yeah. So he, yeah, he, was, so, he was my so, scrum, scrum half at Montpellier. Oh, he was awesome. Yeah, yeah. And another man that surprised everyone, young pup, but you're 10, Leo Berdo. Yeah, Leo Berdo. So, so yep, he's, he, he comes in and, 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 and sits in and now some of our meetings. Um, both the young guys, we, we find that, you know, we just let them do their thing. Um, we don't want to overload them with, with a lot of, uh, you know, stuff in the mind and they just go out there and express themselves. And another man who we've had on the show before, and it's interesting because his time at Saracens didn't end particularly well, but Joel Kapoku is thriving outside of the English bubble, isn't he? Yeah, he's loving it here. Um, you know, he speaks French, which helps. And, uh, and you know, with, with his talents and, and, you know, what he's learned over in the UK and, you know, and come over here and taking his opportunities. He's, uh, nah, he's definitely uh, uh, loving his time here in Lyon. And you mentioned you're there for another few years yet. Yeah. Uh, presumably, that's just great to have your future kind of locked in. And you don't have to think about anything beyond that. You can just enjoy the restaurants for another few years. Yeah, just enjoy it. And, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, bring, bring Lyon rugby into their next stage of, uh, you know, winning titles and, and uh, yeah, leading these young boys. Well, it's a big year ahead. Good luck this week at Saracens, but more specifically later this year, hopefully, at the World Cup. Cheers, man. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Thanks for joining us, mate. That was awesome. Cheers, guys. A man who is obviously loving life in Leon, Johnny. Mate, he's playing well. Um, And you can tell that he just fits the way they've almost built, not their team around them, but the, the role they've given him without the French language base shows how influential he is. Like the way he plays, his power game, his work rate, his will to almost drive his side forward um, up a rugby pitch. 
is awesome to watch. Like he's a very, very talented boy and very driven. So um, I've loved watching him, whether it's his time Crusaders, Leicester was short-lived. Um, he's been fairly phenomenal again already for Leon uh, and quite like, quite rightly earned that big extension, hopefully with a big fat captain's bonus. Um, and yeah, if there's somebody that's going to be around and drive and get the best out of young kids in a squad and be a big positive influence, it's him. And moving on to the Champions Cup, they have lost their first couple of games, Leon, but the way things are at the moment, obviously a tricky trip to Saracens this week, but they've got two points on the board. They have the Bulls at home next week. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of team they put out in the trip to Saracens. But even if they don't get any points, they're still in with a chance of qualification next week. Well, that is the nature of the beast this year with new rules and how qualification works. Uh, we talked about it previously. You need one win really to get through. Um, you've got teams sitting on, Leon are sitting on two points, but they pick up one win with a bonus. You're up to five, six points and quite quickly you can get through. So um we didn't ask him too directly, but I imagine it might be a bit of a mixed 15 cent to Saracens this weekend. And then weekend after they'll come back um, and try and assure, assure, assure four <laughs> points at home uh, next weekend against the Bulls. And elsewhere, what games take your fancy? There's a few, um, but only because they're an absolute lottery. Um, we've talked at length about Clermont, who were about 15 minutes away from losing at home against Perpignan, who are rock bottom of the top 14 at the weekend. But what Clermont's going to rock up this weekend against Leicester? I have no idea. A Leicester side that seems to be figured out a little bit. Teams are having much more ease playing against them this season. Will Clermont have ease at home? I don't know. Um, it's the unknown, but then that's what I'm looking forward to watching and seeing how it unfolds. Sale against Toulouse. Um, Toulouse absolutely steamrolled them in Toulouse away from home. In Manchester, can they do the same thing and cement the place at the top? Probably the Sharks against Bordeaux. That was a proper South African performance by them in Bordeaux in December. Um, proper grunt up front, mauling, big defence, big kick chase. Will Bordeaux have it in them? What kind of squad will they send away from home to South Africa? I don't know. So probably a Sharks win. I'll be up at La Rochelle for La Rochelle Ulster. Again, we talked at the start. Ulster, big point to prove and a big chip on their shoulder after a little bit of a scandal and La Rochelle having 160 fans allowed into the stadium in Dublin after that game was played behind closed doors. So I'm expecting that to be the game of the weekend, the motivation, off-field stuff, adding real spice as well. And then a little bit, almost revenge matches. You've got Rassing against Quinns. Rassing another side, looking completely unsettled. Finn Russell away at the end of the season. I mean, they were really poor against Montpellier at the weekend. And then the last game is Montpellier. I'm looking forward to his Montpellier away to the Ospreys because they lost at home to the Ospreys in December. Can they turn that around, go away to West Wales and pick something up? You'd think they could. They have enough in their squad, enough talent. But again, it comes down to how motivated are these sides for the European competition? What sides are they going to send away from home or are they going to wait until next weekend and give it a real go um, at home in the last round? So some good games, exciting for different reasons. Um, some will be dominant i think toulouse will be dominant others i have absolutely no idea what is going to happen we'll chat about them all next week it's very difficult sat here to look ahead to them to predict them because before every game you have to say depends what team they pick and that's the that's the beauty of the competition this season or the curse depending which way you look at it teams are kind of mixing and matching and picking their games that's just the nature of the format this year like you said you can get through with a win certainly two wins so sat here now you're like you could but, say to lose are going to win they could field a second team and you'd look daft so but that shouldn't be the case like fundamentally of the difficulties that like you had to have a minimum of three wins previously to go through in the group phases now it's a little bit of a mockery in the elitist european competition that you can go through to another round of games and be rewarded with one win like, i think everyone agrees but, I mean, there are other positives. It means that there'll be youngsters from top 14 or from other competitions that will get exposure to an amazing trip to England or to South Africa, and they will get exposure in different cultures, different languages, a high level of competition. But purely in terms of results driven and merit, you shouldn't be getting through with one win. I think everyone would agree. 
Yeah, and we can guarantee an exciting round four because there'll be millions of teams able to qualify. So there you <laughs> carnage. go. Carnage. <laughs> Utter carnage. Exactly. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Jordan Talfair for joining us as well. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye.